Tonight, the state of emergency as historic rain and floods slam the northwest. The devastation seen from every angle. Homes and cars submerged, hundreds of residents displaced, schools closed, rescues underway. The family with four young children airlifted by the Coast Guard. Also, high winds toppling this 18 wheeler and knocking out power to tens of thousands of customers. And now, warnings of more landslides after this one shut down part of a major highway. Also tonight, the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse. Today, the 18 year old taking part in the selection of the jury by drawing names. The jury will decide whether he should be held criminally responsible for killing two people during protests in Kenosha last year. The city on edge as it braces for the outcome. New COVID treatment? Pfizer now asking the FDA to authorize its COVID-19 pill for emergency use. Could it help keep Americans out of the hospital? Plus, the states now seeing a rise in cases as colder weather moves in. Violence erupting on Poland's border with Belarus. Polish authorities using water cannons and tear gas to push back migrants who threw sticks and rocks at border guards. The heartbreaking new images of families piling on top of each other in the freezing cold as Belarus's president lashes out. Plus, Biden's oil dilemma. Gas prices skyrocketing across the country. The U.S. now auctioning off acres of federal waters to oil companies despite a major campaign promise from the president. And is Dave Chappelle being canceled by his own alma mater? The major decision by his high school as the comedian faces continued controversy over that Netflix special. Top Story starts right now. Hey, good evening. I'm Tom Yamas. We begin with that unfolding disaster in the Pacific Northwest as a major storm system brings historic rain and flooding to the region. Washington under a state of emergency as rivers rise to levels not seen in decades. Floodwaters inundating homes and sweeping away cars near the state's border with Canada. The city of Sumas estimating more than 75% of homes right now are damaged. Schools are closed and hundreds of residents are displaced. Dramatic new video showing the moment a Coast Guard helicopter crew rescued 10 people from roofs, including a baby and three other young children. Winds gusting at nearly 60 miles per hour, toppling this 18-wheeler as it crossed a bridge. Tens of thousands of people without power tonight. Landslides also sending debris onto Interstate 5, forcing part of the critical roadway to close. And officials say more landslides should be expected. This storm already turning deadly across the border in Canada. But I want to get right to Miguel Almaguer, who leads us off tonight from the flood zone in Washington. This deadly and devastating deluge delivering an unrelenting blow to the Pacific Northwest, a quadruple catastrophe. Record rain, fierce flooding, whipping winds, and multiple mudslides. They're in a bad way out there. There's a lot of water, and it's only getting higher. With northern Washington state in the storm's bullseye, more than 500 people have been forced from their homes as daring rescues unfold near the Canadian border. Child's with them holding, it's a very small child. The Coast Guard plucking a baby, three children and six adults from fast rising waters. In just hours, six inches of rain swamped the region, a state of emergency amid these deadly conditions. It's bad, it's, it's pretty deep, it's fast. Sarah Ivanhoe and her 15-year-old son wading through freezing water until fishing boats could rescue them. It was up to our knees, our ankles, and outside in our yard. For me, it was like up to my waist in some spots. Facing peril on both sides of the border, massive helicopters lifted over 300 to safety. Many trapped overnight after a highway buckled and a landslide killed at least one in Canada. Back-to-back -back atmospheric rivers helping to dump 40 inches of rain in just 31 days. The wettest fall on record for Seattle. With climate change fueling the intensity and frequency of storms like these, powerful gusts nearly toppled a big rig over the side of a towering bridge as landslides reshape the geography here. The brunt of the storm has passed, but not the flooding. Tonight, one disaster now followed by another for a region still deep in misery. All right, Miguel Almaguer joins us now live from Burlington, Washington. Again, this is near the Canadian border. And Miguel, as we look at your live shot right now, we can see flooding as far as the eye can see there. We know it's very cold. Is there any relief in sight for all the families that are displaced tonight? 
Well, Tom, it could take several days. We know that some rivers in this area are still cresting at this hour, and it may be hours, if not days, for those water levels to start dropping and adding insult to misery. 90% of the West, as you know, is in extreme drought. This is one of the very few areas that simply does not need more water. Tom. Miguel, as we uh, look at your live shot again, I mean, this is incredible how much water is out there. Clearly, power, a major, major concern tonight. Have they gotten any idea when the power may return, or is it just sort of a wait-and-see approach at this hour? Wait and see approach, but it's certainly likely going to be several days, Tom. I mean, the homes out here, many of them are still under feet of water. This water here, say local residents, they have never seen anything like this in generations. So this could be a problem that persists for several days. And of course, it's going to very much uh, test the infrastructure out here, Tom. Miguel Almaguer leading us off with that breaking news tonight on Top Story. Miguel, we thank you. Now to the other major headline tonight, 12 jurors deliberating the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse who's facing double homicide charges for shooting and killing two protesters last summer. The city of Kenosha, Wisconsin, bracing for either outcome. We just received an update from the court. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez again for us from Kenosha tonight. Anthony and Jojo. Tonight, tensions high as Kenosha waits. Hundreds of National Guard troops on standby, but not yet deployed. People who come here for reasons that do not bring to this good to this community, we don't want you here. All right, folks, you can retire to consider your verdicts. The jury now deliberating for more than eight hours in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Today, Rittenhouse himself picked at random six jury alternates from a lottery drum. They'll remain in the courthouse in a separate room while the other 12 jurors deliberate. Seven women and five men, including one person of color. If the jury finds that Rittenhouse provoked the initial attack, then Rittenhouse may lose the argument of self-defense completely. Rittenhouse is charged with five felony counts, the most serious first-degree intentional homicide. The prosecution portraying him as a then 17-year-old vigilante. You cannot claim self-defense against a danger you create. And the defense insisting there was a rush to judgment. Every person who was shot was attacking Kyle. Kyle shot Joseph Rosenbaum to stop a threat to his person. And I'm glad he shot him. You don't even understand the law. The heated law case became a rallying cry for conservatives and gun rights supporters, many of whom raised money for Rittenhouse's defense and $2 million bail. Do you view this as an attack on the Second Amendment? Yes. Emily Cahill thinks he's innocent. People say he was a vigilante, but he was one of us going out and protecting the community. But for the girlfriend of Anthony Huber, the second man Rittenhouse shot and killed, the trial is about accountability. I think that real justice, honestly, would be at least, I mean, at the bare minimum, just some consequence for his actions. All right, NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez again joins us from the ground there in Kenosha outside the courthouse. So, Gabe, we know we have an update from the court tonight. What's the latest with the jury? Uh, yeah, Tom, no specific questions from the jury so far, only to ask for more copies of jury instructions. But within the past few moments, Tom, the judge has just said that he will dismiss the jurors for the night, and they're expected back here to resume deliberations tomorrow morning, Tom. All right, day two starts tomorrow. Gabe Gutierrez with that update. Gabe, thank you. Tonight on Top Story, the trial for three men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. Taking some surprise turns today, the medical examiner shedding light on the injuries Arbery sustained during the shooting. But at the end of proceedings today, one of the defendants testifying on a different matter. Ron Allen explains it all for us. It's my opinion uh, that Ahmad Arbery died of multiple shotgun wounds. The state medical examiner on the witness stand. As the jury saw graphic autopsy photos of Ahmad Arbery's bloody, wounded body, too graphic Madeline to show Chester, here. Right Dr. Edmund Donahue telling the jury there were three rounds fired from the shotgun, just inches from the victim, while Arbery struggled with Travis McMichael. The defense says McMichael acted in self-defense. Prosecutors trying to convince the jury Arbery was the one under attack, asking the witness about his conclusion that a wound to Arbery's wrist and the fatal wound to his chest happened at the same time. Would that be consistent with someone pushing a shotgun away from them? It could be, yes. During the autopsy, what personal items were found in Mr. Arbery's clothing, if any? Uh, no personal items were found, no, no phone, no wallet, no weapons. 
The defense trying to portray Arbery as the aggressor. You saw in the video and in the frame by frame that even with the wound to the wrist, Mr. Arbery was able to swing punches and hit Travis McMichael. Yes. Also today, defense attorney Kevin Goff continuing to ask the judge to keep track of who's in the courtroom gallery, arguing that Arbery's family is inviting black pastors to influence the jury. If the Arbery family has a minister or ministers that are their pastors or members of their church or otherwise, that's one thing. But just trotting in pastor after pastor after pastor, including pastors from other parts of the country that they have no minist apparent ministerial relationship with, uh, is inappropriate here. So I tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. All right, go ahead and see. Late today, without the jury present, defendant William Bryan testifying about prison conditions at the Glen County Detention Center where he's been in custody some 18 months. Are you telling the court that you've basically been in lockdown or solitary confinement for the entire time you've been incarcerated? For the most part, yes, sir. All right. And by that, you're telling the court that you spend 23 hours a day in an individual cell. That's correct. Brian trying to convince the judge that the hardships prevent him from getting a speedy and fair trial. Did you describe briefly for the court that cell? Is it paneled? Is it um, sheetrock or is it cinder block? No, sir. It's cinder block, probably about 8 by 12, something like that. 8 by 12, you think? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the toilet that you use is stainless steel? Correct. All right. Uh, are there any windows to the outside world in this room? No, sir. Okay. The judge denied the request. All right, Ron joins us now from Brunswick, Georgia. Ron, I believe that's the first time we've ever heard from any of the defendants, at least in the trial, and it's happening as the prosecution rested its case. If you could walk our viewers through exactly what happened there and what we're expecting from the defense when they begin their case in the morning. Brian was testifying without the jury present on a very limited issue. He was trying to uh, c request that the judge change the conditions of his confinement at the prisons, claiming that it's a hardship and he's not getting a fair trial because of it, because of the conditions in the cell. Uh, whether the defendants will testify when the defense presents its case remains an open question. Basically, we expect them to argue that this was a case of self-defense, that the this happened in a neighborhood on edge where there had been a spike in crime, and that the defendants were acting as responsible citizens when they perceived a threat from Arbery that day. The uh, prosecution, of course, says that there's no evidence that that was the case and that he was hunted down, shot, and killed for no good reason. Tom? Okay, Ron Allen for us. Ron, we thank you. Now to the economy. Retail sales numbers released today show Americans are shopping, increasing 1.7% from September to October. But it's becoming clear that spiking inflation is forcing customers and small businesses to pay more. Some small businesses now wondering if they'll be able to survive the price hikes. Priscilla Thompson spoke with people on both sides of this cash crunch. So this is a almost $19 jar of tomato sauce. Yeah. How much did it used to be? Uh, I think I used to retail that for about $12. Small business owner Greg Morris thought the worst days of the pandemic were behind him. I thought being closed during COVID was the hardest thing that I would ever experience, but being open after COVID blows, blows that out of the water. Now the owner of the Oaks Gourmet Market and Cafe in California is facing another challenge. I pay now for the price of bacon what I used to pay for steak. Inflation is at its highest rate in 31 years, surging 6.2% in October compared to last year. That's on top of supply chain issues and a labor shortage. Things are just getting more and more expensive and harder and harder to get. I have to pass it on to my customers. Customers like Megan Kaltendack, a regular at the neighborhood market who has also noticed a change. Coffee is a little more expensive. Gas was absolutely higher. Um, just everyday dinner is were like a little pricier than they were before. It was noticeable. Data released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics last month shows meat, poultry, and fish jumping 12%. Gas prices up almost 50% compared to last year. Even so, the increased prices haven't stopped the 28-year-old art director from visiting her neighborhood coffee shop. It doesn't bother me. I know where the inflation's coming from. So we're happy to support small businesses. This sentiment is seen in the nationwide numbers too. New data released by the Commerce Department shows retail sales are strong, up 
percent over just the last month, even as consumers battle inflation. 34, 37. Asia Phoenix owns Besties Vegan Paradise near Hollywood. The store hasn't had to raise prices for customers, but says keeping shelves stocked is a problem. 80% of the brands that we support here are small, black-owned, woman-owned businesses, and they're the ones who are calling us, you know, because they're having trouble um, with their increased costs, being able to stay in the market. Yet another obstacle for business owners still struggling to recover. Can you survive like this? No, I can't. All right, Priscilla Thompson joins us now from Los Angeles. She's live for us here on Top Story. Priscilla, the customer you spoke with said she doesn't mind the higher prices too much, but this has to be concerning for some Americans. You know, every, everybody I talk to is, is talking about how expensive things are getting. And I, even though she wants to support small businesses, which is what we all want to do, at some point there is going to be a cash crunch if we keep paying these high prices for so long. Yeah, Tom, for sure. And this is especially concerning for people who are low in income or on a fixed income, like seniors, for example. In fact, one of the things that that shop owner, Asia, mentioned to me is that she's seeing more customers coming in using government assistance to pay for their groceries. And so there are certainly people who are going without things in order to make ends meet uh, or relying more heavily on public assistance during this time as we see those prices continue to rise. Tom? All right, Priscilla Thompson for us tonight. Priscilla, we thank you for that. As we just heard Priscilla report there in her story, gas prices are nearing highs not seen in a decade. And now the largest ever sale for offshore oil drilling rights is set to take place. Tomorrow, 80 million acres of the Gulf of Mexico will be put on the auction block. It's a move the Biden administration has fought in an effort to protect the environment, but some see it as a solution to higher energy prices. Vaughn Hilliard is in New Orleans tonight with new details on the battle heating up in the Gulf. Tonight, oil companies putting in their final bids for millions of acres of water just miles off the Gulf Coast to drill and extract more oil as Americans face skyrocketing gas prices. All of this area here is what we're talking about leasing. 80 million acres, 100,000 square miles. Have we seen uh, an auction of this size before? Never. This is the largest offshore oil lease ever in the U.S. history. That auction happening this week in New Orleans. We in the oil and gas industry feel that the lease sale is vital for the future of the in energy industry in the United States. But this coming after then-candidate Joe Biden promised on the campaign trail in 2020. No more drilling on federal lands. No more drilling, including offshore. President Biden did just that. Eight days after moving into the White House, signing an executive order, putting a pause on all new oil and gas leases offshore. But this summer, a federal court overruled him, opening the door to this week's mega auction. The government says there are potentially 48 billion barrels of recoverable oil in the federal waters of the Gulf of Mexico. And what color are we talking about that's up for grabs on Wednesday? Uh, all the white area is up for grab. It's massive. Gas prices have steadily risen despite Democrats' efforts to increasingly move towards renewable energy sources. President Biden just this last month acknowledging the need for more oil to be supplied right now to the U.S. On the surface, it seems like an irony, but the truth of the matter is you've all known, everyone knows, that the idea we're going to be able to move to renewable energy overnight is just not rational. While Biden promotes more green energy, he's also pushing OPEC, the international cartel of 13 oil-producing countries, to pump more. That would help bring prices down. But officials from OPEC not budging. America's crude oil production, while lower than its pre-pandemic peak, is still higher than any other time in the last century. About 15 percent of the U.S.'s total domestic oil production comes from offshore drilling in the Gulf. But these projects will not solve today's demands. It's not going to have any effect at the gas pump for a long, long period of time. It'll be five to ten years before any of that shows up on shore at the gas pump. And many in the region angry about what they've already left behind. Multiple administrations have failed to hold the companies accountable. Retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore oversaw the U.S. military's Hurricane Katrina response. Now retired, he started a new mission, his so-called Green Army, in his home state. It has happened for decades. We've treated the Gulf like a cesspool. Go out, get the oil, leave our mess. Here in the Gulf, ecological threats. 18,000 miles of old neglected pipelines remain under these waters. Why right now? We've already had oil disasters in the Gulf of Mexico. 
People remember the BP spill. And smaller oil leaks and spills, still a weekly occurrence in U.S. waters. These aerial images showing the oil slicks this September after Hurricane Ida. The government reporting 39 oil spills in the 10 days after the storm. We are mindful of that responsibility and, and we take it upon ourselves to continue to, to fix that problem. It's not a one day fix, it's going to take a while. For now, the drilling will continue as America wrestles with its energy future. I'm hoping that we make enough progress with the efforts on climate change and reducing the amount of pollution that none of them will be drilled. All right, Von Hillier joins us now live from New Orleans. Von, let's start right there where General Honoré just finished. He said there's that he hopes that, that none of these potential leases are ever actually drilled on, but how likely is that? Exactly, Tom. That is the question here, because when you're talking about these new development sites offshore, you're talking about projects that are five to ten years out, and when you look at where the oil market is going, there's much skepticism, whether it's even worth the investment to build offshore. The cost to build offshore compared to on land is sizable. And that is why even tomorrow, we should not expect all 80 million of those acres to be bought up by these oil companies because there is much skepticism about whether the market will hold for these oil companies out offshore here. And one other note, when you're looking here at these waters here, you've also got to take into account this may be the last time ever that oil companies are able to even bid because the Biden administration is appealing that judge's order, the hope of many is that uh, future leases will never be available out in the Gulf again. Tom? All right, Vaughn Hilliard with a very comprehensive look at some of the oil issues affecting the Biden administration right now. Vaughn, thank you. We head overseas to Poland where the crisis at the border has taken a violent turn. Migrants throwing rocks and sticks at Polish police. The heavily armed forces responding with water cannons and tear gas. Thousands remain trapped between Poland and Belarus, now preparing to spend another night in the freezing cold. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has the latest. Tonight, the growing crisis at the border of Poland and Belarus, descending into violence and chaos. Migrants stranded between the two countries for more than a week, growing desperate hurling rocks and sticks at a line of Polish guards. Heavily armed Polish forces responding with tear gas and stun grenades, shooting water cannons at the crowds trying to enter Poland. The migrants retreating to their makeshift shelters, now soaking wet, bracing for another night in the freezing cold. We, we are waiting. We don't know what will happen. Poland has repeatedly accused Belarus of engineering the surge, Overnight releasing this video, which it says shows Belarusian authorities tearing down barbed wire fences, allowing the migrants to illegally cross. Poland and its allies say it's an attempt by Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko to destabilize the region. A form of revenge for sanctions imposed by the EU after Lukashenko violently quashed pro-democracy protests following the country's elections last summer. Lukashenko luring thousands of migrants to Belarus, enticing them with easy tourist visas from across the Middle East and Africa, then bussing them to the border with Poland. NATO officials today sounding the alarm about the use of human lives as sacrificial pawns. We are deeply concerned about the way the Lukashenko regime is using vulnerable migrants as a hybrid tactic against other countries, and this is actually uh, putting life of the migrants at uh, risk. Belarus has denied facilitating the migrant crossings. Belarus, Polish, Lukashenko today saying, quote, an escalation is not in the interests of either the European Union or Belarus. Still, thousands of men, women and children remain trapped in no man's land, unable to get into Poland and hesitant to return to the countries they were fleeing. <laughs> Among the stranded, nine-year-old Taman, a double amputee living with a rare bone disease. He and his family fled Iraq, hoping to find a better life in Europe, only to be left helpless at its doorstep. Please help me. His uh, children need a better life than right now. He uh, need to the, go into the Europe. Well, you know, Tom, the problems aren't just on the Belarusian side of the border. International human rights groups are also complaining about Poland's massive militarization on their side of the border. And with neither side looking like they're going to give up anytime soon, it's hard to see how this all ends. Eleven people have died so far on that border. And with temperatures plummeting, that number is likely to go up. Tom? Matt Bradley with the heart 
wrenching images there tonight. Matt, thank you. Back here at home to breaking news in the fight against COVID-19. The FDA could authorize booster shots for all adults as early as this week as the agency weighs emergency use authorization for Pfizer's COVID pill. The possible extra protection could come as cases and hospitalizations surge across New England. NBC's Ann Thompson has more. Tonight, the federal government playing catch up with states on who's eligible for a booster shot. In an about face, the FDA could act as early as Thursday to authorize Pfizer's booster for anyone over 18. This news comes amid a stark warning tonight from Vermont, where a nation leading 72% of residents are fully vaccinated. The pandemic is not over. Here, COVID is making a comeback, driving the surge, the unvaccinated. The data speaks for itself. About three quarters of Vermont's hospitalizations and about 70% of our cases are unvaccinated. Vermont's two-week case count jumps 60%. In fact, across New England, the two-week case count is up in every state except Connecticut. Yet even there, the virus is taking a deadly toll. At the Gear Village Senior Community, a nursing home and rehabilitation center, eight residents died 89 residents and staff infected since the end of September. This despite nearly all having been vaccinated. The same folks that we found were vulnerable at the beginning are still vulnerable. All these warning signs as Americans get ready to travel for the holidays amid COVID fatigue and mixed messaging on who should get booster shots. Still, health officials say vaccinations remain the best defense. It just makes the chances of getting infected incredibly low and that if you do get infected, that you don't suffer some of those really severe complications from the disease. Despite an uptick in cases in some areas, Washington, D.C.'s mayor announcing the city will lift its indoor mask mandate for public places Monday. And here in New York City at the crossroads of the world, Times Square's New Year's Eve celebration is back on with a new price of admission proof that you're fully vaccinated. Tom? And Thompson for top story tonight, and we thank you. With COVID cases rising once again across the country, we have some developing news tonight. A new treatment for the virus could be on the way. Pfizer today asking the FDA for emergency use authorization for its antiviral pill, Paxlovid. The company says the treatment can be made cheaply, and get this, it can be taken at home. So I know we have lots of questions out there. We want to bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar for us. Dr. Azar, thanks so much for joining Top Story. You bet. Thanks so for So give us some of the top lines on this new pill. People need to think of it the way they would think about Tamiflu. This is an oral antiviral, which means it's a pill that you can take by mouth. It's a medicine that is used very similar to Tamiflu. It's also used or is very similar to some older medicines that we've used for HIV and hepatitis C, let's say. It essentially hijacks the virus's ability to replicate itself, stops the virus dead in its tracks, and according to the news report, which again, it's a press release, right. um, cuts the risk of hospitalization in people who have a risk for severe disease progression uh, up to 89%, and it reduces the risk of death by 100%. There were no deaths in the treatment group. Do you foresee this being a prescription drug or something people can just get over the counter? It will 100% be a prescription drug. Okay. So right now, Tom, Pfizer has three parallel studies that they are doing. One is the one that they reported on, which is taking uh, an individual who's unvaccinated, who has one risk factor for severe disease and giving them the pill. Then the other group is something like you and me, let's say, if we get, we're vaccinated, but we get COVID, do we get to take the pill? That's that this, this, the readout from that part of the study has not been made available yet. And then there's a third group, something called post-exposure prophylaxis, which means let's say you get sick with COVID, but can your wife take the pill? So it's, it's, it's all good. You know, we, we do want to see this kind of antiviral available, but I would make one comment. And that is that in order to be eligible to take this pill, you need to test positive for COVID-19. And so we, we need definitely to have those rapid tests available and which we've been saying for quite some time now. Right. So, you know, we're talking about emergency use authorization here and we've been talking about this for boosters for the vaccines for the other covid pill um, so my question is does the fda have the bandwidth to be taking all this incoming data and then say it's, it's fine yes let's do the emergency use authorization it's good for all of americans 
They do. I mean, they've been working really, really hard. We know that, as, as has the advisory committee at the CDC, but this is an unprecedented situation. And, um, you know, they. I'm, I'm glad you actually brought it up because I don't think that they get enough credit for the work that they're doing. Um, and, you know, remember what an EUA is. It means that it's going to authorize this pill for the duration of the pandemic unless they actually apply for that BLA, that biological license application, which means that it would be fully approved, which means it would be here to stay uh, after the pandemic, which I do anticipate. Um, you know, we do think that COVID-19 or, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus will become endemic, which means it'll be circulating every year. Um, and there will always be people who are at risk for severe disease. So I anticipate needing an oral antiviral in the toolbox, um, you know, for the foreseeable future, if not forever. Again, and this would be for somebody who tests positive for COVID-19. This is a treatment pill. This is a treatment pill to prevent, you know, disease progression to more severe disease, hospitalization and death. All right, Dr. Natalie Azar, we always thank you. Still ahead tonight, the child caught in the crossfire, the eight-year-old killed during a shootout. Two teenagers now charged with her death, even though they did not fire the fatal shot. So what happened here? The details on this confusing case next. Plus the terror attack in Uganda's capital, multiple explosions rocking the city just minutes apart. What authorities found in one suspect's home. And the wildfire breaking out near the Rocky Mountains. The evacuations now underway. Stay with us here on Top Story. We're just getting started. Back now on Top Story, two teens facing charges after a shootout led to the death of an eight-year-old girl. Prosecutors now saying the teenager's actions initiated the events, even though the medical examiner says it was the police bullets that ended the girl's life. NBC News Now correspondent Zinclay Esamwa has a story. Tonight, two teenagers charged with murder in the shooting death of eight-year-old Fanta Billity when the fatal bullet was fired by police. According to prosecutors, an 18 and 16-year-old exchanged gunfire outside a high school football game just outside Philadelphia back in August. The Delaware County Medical Examiner saying Fanta was hit in the crossfire, accidentally killed by a police officer shot. While the teens did not fire the shot that killed the eight-year-old, prosecutors are charging them, saying their actions initiated the shooting, the legal maneuver known as transferred intent. The prosecutor is currently suggesting is that he's going to charge them with all the crimes that could be attributed directly to the police like first degree murder. The community here outraged that police officers are not being held accountable, protesting in the streets. At this point, both officers are still on the job. Demonstrators in other cities have also marched to honor the life of Fantability. The lawyer for the Billity family says they think justice is not being served. I think that uh, the family members, uh, along with me, think that it's a difficult uh, uh, stretch for the district attorney to be able to successfully prosecute these two uh, men for what they did uh, that uh, in the aftermath led up to the uh, the death of Fanta Billity. Uh, clearly, the family thinks that um, the police officers killed Fanta and um, that they are the ones that need to be held accountable. In a statement, Delaware County District Attorney Jack Stolsteimer said, today is an important step in my office's continuing effort to seek justice for Fanta. You have to draw a line between what they did and what the police did. Understanding that a tragedy did occur here. All right, Zinclair joins us now in studio. This is a very strange case. It's one of the reasons why we're doing this story. Do we know what's happened, if anything, to the officers? Yes, yeah, so the officers, ever since the shooting, have been placed on paid administrative leave. Their names still have not been released. But it's worth noting that the DA's preliminary finding did find that it was the shots of the officers fired when returning fire that ultimately hit four others in the crowd. That includes Fanta and her sister. So November 18th, we're going to hear from a grand jury. They're going to determine whether or not police use of force was justified. Tom? All right, Sinclair, thank you for that. When we come back, the attack outrage, the suspect caught on camera, hitting a police officer with a heavy object, but he was released without bail, and this isn't the first time he's been accused of this type of crime. And rent prices exploding. The city's seen the biggest jump in prices and why it may be bad news for those who want to go south for the winter. Stay with us.
All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the suspect freed without bail after allegedly attacking a New York City police officer. Surveillance video showing the suspect striking an officer from behind with a backpack that contained a metal safe. The 30-year-old officer was hospitalized. 39-year-old Issus Thompson was arrested but was released just one day later under supervised release. Thompson had already served prison time for stabbing an NYPD officer in 2008. No word yet on why bail was not requested. Mandatory evacuations are underway after a wildfire erupted near Rocky Mountain National Park. The fire erupting 90 minutes outside of Denver. High winds, above average temps, and drought conditions fueling those flames. Authorities say it is threatening structures. Residents and businesses were forced to evacuate. Access to mountain roads shut down, but so far, no injuries reported. All right, and fresh fallout for Dave Chappelle following that controversial Netflix special. His former high school in D.C. has postponed renaming its theater after the famous comedian. In a statement, the school recognized Chappelle's millions of dollars in donations to help them with underfunding, but says it needs time to engage with students who threatened a walkout over the honor the renaming ceremony would have been. That was scheduled for next week. It's now slated for April 2022. All right. All right, we turn now to Money Talks, the biggest financial stories of the day and why they matter to you. While prices for goods creep up because of inflation, a new report found that rental prices are also steadily climbing. CNBC real estate correspondent Diana Olick joins us now. She's out with a new report. Diana, this report shows that rent increases are happening at different paces and different price ranges. So who's seen the biggest rent jump? Well, this is especially for single family rental homes. So we want to say that first. But actually, we're seeing the biggest rent growth at the highest end of the market. And the reason for that is we are seeing an older, higher income renter these days. Millennials waited a longer time to get married, to have kids, to move into that year when they say, OK, I need a single family home in the suburbs. The problem is now they hit that point. They're aging into that point and they've hit a market that is incredibly pricey and incredibly competitive. So they're turning to single family rentals and they're able to pay a lot more. So, Diana, this also isn't happening in every major U.S. city. Can you tell our viewers where the hottest markets are right now? Well, number one is Miami. It's seeing huge growth, over 20 percent in single family rentals. Also Las Vegas. And that's because we're starting to see tourism come back. And these are markets that their economies run on tourism. Uh, so you're seeing more people come back. You're seeing more workers come back. You're seeing more demand for those single family homes. And that's why you're seeing the higher rents there. Of course, in other cities, cities, the bottom of the market, you're seeing areas like Boston and even New York City is seeing the slowest rent growth. And part of that is because the rent Rent was so high there to begin with. And also you saw an exodus in New York City during the pandemic. People are now just starting to come back again. So while rents are up from a year ago, they're not up nearly as much as in some of the other markets. Any, any signs, I should say, that this could be slowing down? You know, I haven't seen it, and I'm as surprised as you are, because at some point you have to hit that affordability wall. You have to say, how much can people or will they be willing to spend on a single-family rental home? But I'll tell you, we got a report from the home builders today who said they are still seeing continued increased demand from people who want to buy new homes because they can't find existing homes to buy. Demand is just that strong. They're slowing production because they're having all these supply chain issues. So, again, they can't get enough homes out to people. There's not enough supply. So you still see those same people going back into the single family rental market. If demand remains, prices have nowhere to go but up. Seeing the trends you're seeing right now in the rental market, I want to take you to the negotiating table right now. If people have the chance to sign a one year or two year lease, there's so many unknowns in the economy. What would you say? Well, it's so interesting because for the first time, we're actually seeing bidding wars on rentals. Usually that's reserved for the for sale home market. You don't see them on single family rentals, but we're hearing that from landlords. So I would say the same thing to people that I say in the buying market is don't overstep what you can do. And remember that a very hot market, you don't want to catch a falling knife, right? You don't want to overspend and get into a, a situation where you're house poor. So again, bidding wars, you know, there's always another house out there. I would not get into that in the rental market especially because you're not getting any return. All right, Diana Olick for us tonight. Diana, we appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with that deadly terror attack in Uganda. 
Two separate suicide bombings rocking the capital city just minutes apart. At least three people killed, including a police officer, with dozens more injured. Police say three attackers were found dead. A fourth suspect followed to his home where more explosives were found. Authorities blaming ISIS-affiliated groups, the Allied Democratic Forces. In the Americas, Ecuador's prison chief and armed forces chief have resigned after another deadly prison riot in Guayaquil. A gun battle between rival gangs inside the country's largest prison killed nearly 70 inmates over the weekend. Police believe the inmates are getting some weapons and ammo through drones. The bloodshed comes less than two months after gang battles there killed nearly 120 inmates. And the Pentagon says an Iranian Navy helicopter came dangerously close to a U.S. Navy warship in the Gulf of Oman. Footage published by an Iranian news agency appears to show last week's incident. The Pentagon says the aircraft came within 25 yards of the ship and circled it three times. U.S. officials say the incident had no impact on the Navy's operations. All right, now to the arms race between Russia and the United States. NBC News got an exclusive look at the former Soviet Union's efforts to build up its fighter jet technology. In his U.S. television debut, a top Russian official talked competition and tension over weapon sales to NATO allies. NBC's Keir Simmons has that story. Sergei Chemosov shows me a prototype stealth fighter. This is the checkmate. The Su-75, like America's cutting-edge F-35, but cheaper, the Russians say. The key difference between the two, the F-35 is real, this is a model and untested. Still, the Russians call their plane the checkmate. Who are you putting in check? The Americans? The F-35? You can really only compare our airplane with the F-35. Usually, we are competing with the U.S. This is Chemosov's first American television interview. A member of President Putin's inner circle, they were both in the KGB in Germany. There's very little we know about him then. What was he like? What did he do in Germany with you? We were both in intelligence. So you can't talk about it? No. I would rather not. We meet at the Dubai Air Show. U.S. and Russian aircraft on parade in the same airspace. Russia is the world's second largest arms exporter after the U.S. State-owned Rostec dominates Russia's arms industry. Chemosov is the CEO and a target of U.S. sanctions. I was also sanctioned because I am a friend of Putin. But he is still said to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Who do you plan or hope to sell the plane to? I think that this airplane will be interesting to practically everyone. Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Completely possible, yes. These are American allies. No. Well, Turkey is also a U.S. ally, but nevertheless, they purchased the S-400. That's an air defense system Turkey bought from Russia, despite being a member of NATO and earning U.S. sanctions. Business. It's business. business. And business, he tells me, is good. Does it give you some pleasure to sell the S-400 to a country that is a NATO country? <laughs> It's driving a wedge between Turkey and America. We think that we won in this case. Just last month, Congress was told that arms sales are a central element of Russian foreign policy. Every deal increasing President Putin's international influence. Tom? Keir Simmons from Dubai for Top Story. Keir, we appreciate that. Coming up, cold case solved. The U.S. Marshal tracking down a bank robber five decades after one of Ohio's biggest heists. How he finally found him thanks to some evidence from his dad. Stay with us. Back now with a 52-year-old bank heist solved. A U.S. Marshal picking up where his dad left off, helping to close the case and identify the fugitive who eluded investigators for decades. Correspondent Maura Barrett has the story. 50 years ago, this man pulled off one of the biggest bank robberies in Cleveland, Ohio, and then vanished. No one could figure out where Theodore Conrad was until now. I really believe this was a dare for him in 1969. We spoke with U.S. Marshal Peter Elliott, who watched his father, also a U.S. Marshal, struggle with this cold case for years. Now relieved that the elusive criminal has been identified. 
What was the key to finally figuring out who he was? When people lie, they lie close to home. The obituary was huge. The obituary for Thomas Randell said he was born on July 10th of 1947. Conrad was born on July 10th of 1949. Details also overlapped on where Conrad grew up, where he went to college, and his parents' names. The plot he ultimately got away with, later featured on shows like America's Most Wanted, inspired by Hollywood. Conrad worked as a bank teller at the time. He became obsessed with the 1968 film The Thomas Crown Affair. You know the story about a bored millionaire who executes the perfect bank heist. Modeled himself after Thomas Crown. It was easy for him. There was no security. He left a lunchtime with a bag with had $215,000 in it, which is pretty much about $1.7 million today. He transformed his identity to Thomas Randell, moving to the Boston suburbs, not far from where the movie took place. With the clues from the obituary and the deathbed confession, Elliot was able to put more pieces together using evidence originally discovered by his father. We were able to pull documents from um, federal court in Boston where we learned that Randall uh, filed for bankruptcy in 2014 and get those signatures off those documents and match those to the documents my, my dad had from 1967 from the New England College application. An investigation spanning two generations finally marked case closed. Mora joins us now. So how did this go on for so long? If Conrad was living a normal life, you'd think there'd be a trail. Right, Tom, but the U.S. Marshals say that this was wi largely before fingerprinting was widely used. Conrad wasn't even fingerprinted as a measure of security at that bank that he worked at when he was a young man. And he did go on to live a, no a normal life as a law-abiding citizen, going on to become a golf pro and even a salesman. His family didn't even know his true identity until he told them on his deathbed. And Elliot tells me that the family, though, also will not be facing any repercussions for not bringing this information uh, to authorities right after Conrad passed. Tom. Hold, hold on, a bank robber and a golf pro. This sounds like this could be a, a much longer story and a pretty good movie. All right, Maura, thanks so much for that story. When we come back, touchdowns for mom, the high school player leading his team to the playoffs just one day after losing his biggest fan. What he told us about that emotional game and the Super Bowl quarterback who took notice. This is a great story. Stay with us. All right, finally tonight, we want to bring you the touchdown tribute that's gone viral. A high school quarterback who lost his mom to cancer, stepping on the field the next day, and get this, scoring eight touchdowns. At every game, New Jersey high school quarterback Alex Brown's mom, Michelle, was right there, cheering him on from the sidelines. Yeah, she was uh, definitely my biggest fan. Just look. Here she is leading the Red Bank Catholic football team in a chant earlier this year. One, two, three, three, three. The team wearing pink that night in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We wheeled my mom in and it was kind of like a surprise to her. Uh, we gave her the game ball. That moment would be the last time Alex's mother would attend a football game. Being my number one supporter, it's, it's tough now that she's gone. Michelle lost her 14-year battle with cancer last week. The day before... Or my dad told me, and I went down to say my goodbyes and stuff. You know, my head for the next two days were all over the place. I still went to practice. I still played in the game because I knew that's what she would want me to do. Alex took the field the very next day, remembering his mother's words. She taught me to be strong. She, she gave me that courage to step onto that field, and then... You know, just playing that game, I just I just played for her. From the pocket, Alex connected with more than just his receivers downfield. Uh, you know, I kind of realized that her spirit was there on the field with us that night. So I, I kind of got, like, a little excited just to, like, know that she was still there with me. So, you know, the rest of the night was honestly really fun. His mother with him in spirit all the way as he went on to score, get this, eight touchdowns. Leading his team to a playoff victory. After the game, my dad comes up to me and just says, I'm very proud of you. You did something special tonight, and a lot of people are going to remember that. His story getting national attention from ESPN Sports Center. His idol, Tom Brady, commenting on that post, quote, proud of you. It was amazing. I mean, I can't put it into words because there are no words to describe that feeling. But for Alex, it all goes back to that special connection 
to his number one fan, watching from the stands, and now from above with the same message. To keep hope in your life and to stay strong. And we thank the Brown family for sharing that very personal story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. A quick programming note, but a very important one. Make sure to tune into Hallie Jackson Now, which premieres tomorrow. The big rollout, 5 p.m. Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. All right, we'll see you later. I'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.